This is an information seminar on direct provision hosted by the Open Doors Initiative, featuring Minister for Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth, Roderick O'Gorman, and Melissa O'Queeve, Country Head of Northern Trust. This seminar is kindly sponsored by Northern Trust and live captioning is being provided by AI Media. I think when we reflect the pandemic that we're all living through, I think has really reminded us all of the importance of standing together and looking out for each other. And World Refugee Day is about exactly that. It's about standing together to celebrate the strengths and the courage and the perseverance of millions of refugees. It's about the power of inclusion. And at, at Northern Trust, to give you a bit of background, we are committed to diversity, equity and inclusion. And as part of that commitment, we are working to break down the barriers that exist for diverse groups who are looking for jobs. And this includes seeking out opportunities for refugees, because we all know that participation in the labour market is one of the important mechanisms for helping individuals and in fact families to integrate into society. So we're very, very proud to work closely with the Open Doors Initiative as they work to improve employment opportunities for refugees across Ireland. And we're really encouraged by what we see, the momentum and the commitment we see from many other member organisations. So actually, I'd like to take the chance to thank, thank the team at Open Doors Initiative for hosting today. As we know, there are issues with direct provision in Ireland. And the white paper released by the government was very, very welcome, outlining the plans of replacing it with the new international protection accommodation policy. And that is so welcome. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Minister, for your opening address. Thanks. Thank you very much, Melissa. And look, I'm, thank you so much for inviting me to, to speak here today. And it's a real privilege to be invited here today by the Open Doors Initiative. And I, I think we all know that successful integration doesn't happen by accident. Uh, and look, it, it requires positive, proactive and practical steps from government. But I think from particularly from, from communities, uh, from employers and from individuals as well. And, individual, uh, and initiatives like this, the Open Doors Initiative and the employers that they work with, are they're such a wonderful example of doing exactly that. And I just want to begin by, first of all, commending this organisation for all its work and, and, and for all the uh, employers for the, the supports that they provide to it. Um, integration is just one of the lengthy uh, titles of this, uh, this particular department, uh, but it's a very wide ranging and it's a very fundamental element of what we're trying to seek to achieve here in this department. And that goes from the uh, refugee resettlement program all the way to community integration. And today I've been asked to speak maybe about one of the most significant elements of our integration brief, and that's direct provision. When the Green Party entered the programme for government negotiations last year, one of our key commitments was to achieve a, a clear commitment to end direct provision. And it was something that was hard fought for during those negotiations and one of the final elements of the programme when it was agreed. And I think this the, the reason we focused on this is because we know that direct provision is sorely lacking in how it's treated, how it has treated people within the system. And the Irish people acknowledge that, they see that, and they want to see it ended. And direct provision, as we know, was established as a temporary measure about 20 years ago to deal with a, um, a, a sudden uh, increase in the number of people sinking international protection uh, here in the country. And it's evolved over time, but it has evolved not to suit the needs of the people actually in the system, but to kind of suit the system itself, suit the, the, the people who, who provide the, uh, the, the, the services and operate it. And it's structured in such a way that it can act to isolate, uh, to marginalise people, not only geographically, and it, and it very much does that, but also marginalise and isolate people from communities, even in the areas that they are living in. And over time, that's created a profound breakdown in trust between the state and the people who are currently living in direct provision and those who have gone through the system. And it has led to what the uh, ombudsman, the, sorry, the children's ombudsman described as a culture of fear within the system. So look, we can change the structures of the system. We can even change its name. 
But fundamentally, what we need to do is change that culture. And it's for that reason that we're not looking to improve direct provision. We're not looking to amend it. We're looking to end it and create an entirely new system, the International Protection Support Service. Um, and that's why the new model for this International Protection Support Service, as set out in the white paper, has human rights at its very core. It's focused on the not-for-profit approach and integration from day one is one of its, uh, its, its key principles. And this International Protection Support Service is a fundamental shift in how the state will meet its obligations, both legal but also moral, in terms of supporting people who come here to Ireland seeking protection. So I want to maybe give a brief overview of the new, how the new system will operate for anyone who's not familiar with it. So direct provision will be phased out between now and the end of 2024 and pre replaced with the new International Protection Support Service, which will cater for people's needs in a fundamentally different way. Under the new system, international protection applicants who avail of state-provided accommodation will initially stay in one of a number of reception and integration centres. These centres, they'll be state-owned, they'll be purpose-built, and they'll have suitable accommodation for families and for single people. And single people will have access to own room accommodation, so they have their own privacy. And these uh, reception and integration centres will have a range of support services built in and available on site. And people will stay in the reception integration centres for a maximum of four months. And again, that focus on integration from day one will be really prominent here in terms of English language classes will be provided. There'll be links with employment activation services, TUSLA, the HSE, the Legal Aid Board, all of those will be present uh, on site. And um, applicants will have case worker support to address uh, and, and facilitate any immediate needs that they may have. And a comprehensive vulnerability assessment will be undertaken of each applicant to identify if they have specific vulnerabilities. Maybe they're an a member of the LGBTI plus community. Maybe they were a victim of sexual violence in, in their flight from their original home. And that will allow us to kind of tailor uh, services to meet those particular needs. After four months, if an applicant has not yet had a decision on their application, they will meet, move to state-provided accommodation in towns and cities across the country while they wait the outcome of their application. And this new phase will uh, support the applicant to live independently and it will foster inclusion and integration between applicants and their host communities. An accommodation for this second strand will be delivered through a multi-strand approach it will uh, include housing provided through urban renewal schemes by approved housing bodies and through a state funded building and purchase program. And during this second phase, families will have own door accommodation, while again, single people will have own room accommodation and will share living and cooking uh, facilities. And my department is working very closely with the housing agency, which will support us in terms of the purchase and the building of the housing and apartment complexes in various elements, in various places around the country. And I'm very grateful to the housing agency for the really strong, practical support given to our department uh, at this time. And accommodation will be located in urban areas across the country. And again, that will be according to a settlement pattern, pattern that's been currently devised by the CCMA, the City and County Management Association. And again, I also want to thank the CCMA for, for their support up to this, this point. Uh, and existing interagency working groups that are present in local authorities all over the country at the moment, and which provide services to refugees using coming into the into communities through the Irish Refugee Resettlement Program, they will be given an, uh, an expanded mandate so they can also provide uh, supports to international protection applicants living in this community accommodation all over the country. We're working to complete the transition to the new model by December 2024. A detailed implementation plan is currently being developed and that will drive forward changes each year between now and 2024. Implementation of the new policy is going to be overseen by what we call a program board. So that's a, 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 a kind of a implementation body made up of civil servants from key government departments, but also bringing in some maybe public sector and indeed some private sector expertise as well. And this will meet at least four, four times a year to oversee the overall plan. And my department, the transition team in my department will be working on it on a daily basis. But importantly, 
we're also looking to have oversight. So we're going to have a, a, an independent advisory group and I'll be announcing the membership of that in, in the next couple of weeks. And it will be three individuals who will be able to assess how much progress my department, the entire government are making towards the delivery of the white paper. And we'll be able to sound the alarm and basically, I suppose, hold our feet to the fire in terms of making sure that we are actually implementing this and we're actually getting it done. And there'll also be political oversight in terms of I'll have to report back to the Cabinet Subcommittee on Social Policy on, 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 and Equality, as will the Minister Justi for Justice in terms of the work her department are doing to shorten the processing times for people to get a, a decision on their application. While direct provision will be ended over the course of the next three and a half years, uh, I'm also very conscious of the needs, the need to improve the conditions for people currently living in the system. And as I said earlier this year, we began piloting the vulnerability uh, assessment program so we can uh, understand the specific needs, the specific vulnerabilities applicants uh, have. And um, we've also, uh, in the program for government, we also committed to ensuring that international protection applicants would have access to bank accounts and to driver's licenses. Uh, the Minister for Transport, Eamon Ryan, is currently progressing the Road Traffic Miscellaneous Provisions Bill, which will allow us to provide driver's licenses to international protection applicants. And I know recently the Irish Banking and Payments Federation announced that bank accounts would be available to international protection applicants. And that's certainly something that I really announce, uh, sorry, I really welcome. The Department of Justice shortens the time period within which an international protection applicant could apply to work in the country, so they can now seek uh, to work from, from six months, uh, and the um, visa that they can get, the work visa is now longer, it, it can be for, uh, for, for a 12-month period. And also, I, I wrote to all direct provision providers to ensure that they're providing uh, period products to all, um, to all um, people in direct provision who need them free of charge. And in March, myself and Minister Harris announced that from the 2021-22 academic year, international protection applicants who have permission to work and are seeking access to post-leaving cert courses, PLCs, will no longer have to pay international fees. And that, again, will make them far more accessible for uh, IP applicants. And these changes are all going to improve the lives of the people currently living in the system. And I'm committed to making more changes in current current months. So in making a home here, people seeking protection strengthen and enrich our communities and they strengthen and, are, and enrich our state. But as a state, we have a duty and a responsibility to support integration. And throughout the process of implementing the white paper, I'm committed to engaging with, with NGOs, with organizations like Open Doors Ireland and local communities in order to welcome new residents across the country. And we know that the Irish people want to see an end to direct provision. Uh, they want to see people coming here receive better support. And the white paper commits this government to doing, to doing just that. And I look forward to its successful implementation by the end of 2024. So thanks very much for the opportunity to speak today and look forward maybe to clarifying some, some points when we, when we go to the questions. Okay, so thank you, Minister. I must say, listening to you, I can see the authenticity and excitement about what you're about to do. So it's, it's really great to hear. I, do, I was particularly touched by your comments around culture. And, you know, uh, I, I knew you were referring specifically around the culture of fear, etc. But on a broader level, as a country, that we're always been known for our great welcomes. Um, I'm not so sure that some of the refugee people have got the great welcome. So just around that whole topic of racism in Ireland, how do we get rid of it? How do we tackle that? What, first of all, what, what can the government do and then what can we all do? Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's a huge issue um, and it's one, I suppose, I think maybe we all looked away from it for a little while. Like, you know, we've, I suppose I would have seen, I live in Dublin 15. It's a very diverse part of the, uh, part of the, the, the city, part of the country. Blanchestown, Tyrrellstown, Mulhuddert all have a, a huge uh, mix of populations. And I, I would have seen that change happen, I suppose, in, uh, I suppose the uh, early 2000s. I think we had a, our, our last national anti-racism strategy was in 2008. But since then, we just haven't really touched on the issue. And as you know, um, George Incheno was killed in uh, my um, area in uh, early in this year after a, a, an incident with, with uh, the, the Garda Rapid Response Unit. And that may be laid bare. Uh, fractures that are that are in our communities that maybe hadn't been totally clear or, or maybe were being overlooked. 
So the issue is, of racism is, is central to what my department is addressing and in fairness central to what government is addressing as well. So the previous government had established a new national anti-racism committee. Uh, it's been uh, chaired by Professor Caroline Fennell from uh, UCC and it had been meeting and it has now published its interim uh, report and will be publishing a final report by the end of August. We're, we're hoping to receive that. And they're actually still taking public submissions at the moment. So, and, and I'd really invite anybody who's interested to make a submission. They're taking public submissions until the uh, until I think maybe the 12th or 14th of, uh, of, of July. And they are very much focused on, I suppose, individual racism, but also institutional racism as well. And as I say, they'll be bringing forward proposals for an action anti-racism anti plan. And then it will be up to government to take those proposals and, and actually uh, push forward with that, that action plan. And I'm looking forward to receiving that. As you know, I suppose on the, the, the sharp end of racism is, is hate crime. And the government brought forward heads of bill for a, a hate crime legislation by Minister McEntee just before she, she went on maternity leave in, uh, in, in May. Uh, and that will be introduced into the Oireachtas uh, in, in the, the autumn term. I'm very excited about that. I think that's really important. Again, that was another uh, priority of the Green Party going into the programme for government negotiations. But look, I think all members of the government see the, the real importance of that, of that piece. Just in terms of Angarda Siakana, because I suppose coming out of uh, you know, a year and a half, two years of Black Lives Matter, uh, very conscious of the toxic relationship between the Black and mixed race community and police in much of the United States, in parts of France, in parts of the UK. It's really important that we don't allow that happen here in Ireland. And I know there are tensions there. I know it from talking to community groups in my, in my area. Uh, from talking to youth groups in my area and indeed from talking to members of the, the Garda, Gardaí in my area, particularly our, our community uh, police. Uh, so I, I met with Commissioner Harris there last week uh, and um, Deputy Commissioner Paula Hillman and we discussed this issue in detail. They outlined the training and the processes that they're bringing into an Ingarda Siakona. They're also actually bringing a specific uh, local diversity forum into the Dublin 15 area, which I'm delighted about. And I think that could be a model to, uh, to, to work elsewhere. But I think we need to see the Gardaí reflect the communities they police. And right now, visually, they don't. Uh, and I think that's really important as well. But that issue of culture, maybe just to draw back to what you're saying, is particularly important in the Gardaí. And we have amazing guards. And I know our community Gardaí uh, in Dublin 15 do fantastic work and fantastic outreach. But look, in any organization, there are going to be those who, who don't share a, a view of, 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 a, of a diverse and progressive society. But I think, I suppose, when people with those views are on Garda Siakana, because it is a body that exercises public power, because it has those, those, those that, that, that kind of role, that's particularly concerning. And that's why I suppose I've put a, a focus on engaging with the, with the Gardaí and looking to support them in terms of uh, the work they do to enhance cultural and awareness training, particularly looking at the whole area of anti-bias training. I think we all have biases uh, and we do, uh, but I think it's important to acknowledge them and to understand how you address your own personal biases in the context of, uh, of, of your work as a public servant. Yeah, that all makes sense. And I do agree with you. You know, you can't be what you can't see. So, you know, if the guards or guardy don't represent the community as it is. Similarly, by the way, you politicians and encouraging more people into politics. We in, in our businesses are all trying to encourage that kind of diversity. And absolutely, Northern Trust and myself are absolutely committed. Diverse teams and diverse groups get better results across the board. So, yeah, that all sounds very, very sensible. Yeah. Um, my other question is, so you've got, a, you know, an audience here and obviously uh, probably people who showed up, who came to listen, have a particular interest. If you were just, first of all, we'll come back to companies, us as individuals, what are like the one or two things that we could be doing better in our day to day life that would align with what you're trying to achieve? And then similarly, corporates, what could we be doing to support this great initiative that you're rolling out? Just is this in terms of specifically ending direct provision or more generally kind of the bigger picture, the, the bigger, the, the bigger direct picture, ending direct provision, not, not necessarily focusing on the racism topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, look, I, I suppose on an individual basis, 
one of the things we can do is, is listen and listen to the experiences of people, whether it's the experience of those who've been in direct provision or particularly the, the experience of people who've, who've, ex, who, who've experienced racism. Um, because uh, I, I think maybe more and more people, I, I, um, I was on a show with Claire Byrne there recently about maybe four or five weeks ago, and she had maybe six uh, black and mixed race Irish uh, men and women, most of them quite young, and they just all spoke about their experiences. Some of them, uh, they're, they're kind of for, for a second generation, and some of them, uh, their, their families were, were, were here for a much longer time. So they kind of spoke about the experience of being black or being mixed race in, our, in Ireland and all these small little things that they had to endure over the years that maybe people wouldn't have. Certainly when I saw, heard something, I was like, God, you think, God, did I ever do that? And I actually, one of my, my close friends from, from school is, is mixed race. He, he lives over in the States now. And I remember texting him, uh, that night and be like, did we ever say stuff that we thought was okay, but actually wasn't okay? And just kind of reflect on, 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 on I suppose, what we say ourselves, because it is an incredibly, uh, from, from, from listening to people, uh, you hear, you know, when Ireland, you know, was, and almost when I was, you know, 10, 12, Ireland was an entirely white country. And when you saw someone from any different uh, ethnicity, you turned and looked, you, you just, I remember on the street being like, oh, and your mom kind of hushing you, but, but you did turn and look. Uh, and we go from, and for people who lived here at that time, that idea of everyone kind of looking at them uh, uh, and that lack of anonymity uh, of being the, the center of attention in every room, whether you wanted it or not, that was just a perspective I'd never heard of before. So I, I just have found recently reading, reading and listening, and also then in terms of uh, my role as, as Minister for Equality, I work a lot with, uh, with, with, with traveller organisations and hearing their experience of racism, and that's an experience of racism that is much older in this country and is much more consistent and is institutionalised. And in terms of, you know, um, when travellers, you know, when I was going to primary school at that same time in, in primary schools all over the country, travellers were being led to a separate desk and given crayons and told that's the height of your education, colour in for the next eight years, or potentially brought to a separate classroom and told there, that's where you go. So that was in our lifetime. So there was uh, explicit racism happening in our lifetimes, probably beside us by teachers who didn't, I don't, probably didn't mean it, but were, in, so, and, and that is a, a true reflection of, of institutional racism. So I've just found listening a bit more, listening to other people's experience and being exposed. And, and I, I, sorry, I'm going on here a bit, so I'll end on this, but I just, I suppose, you know, I, I've quite a, a comfortable middle-class life and I wouldn't have been exposed maybe to so many views uh, as I have been maybe in, in, in the last year in terms of in, engaging with different groups. And that's just listening can, can, I think, really help. And, you know, it certainly changed my perspectives on a lot of things. Yeah, that's really good, actually, and it is it is very very true, and we all can things. So I, I, I listened, I think, and, and actually exposing ourselves to lots of experiences is important. What about corporates? Like I, I'm delighted to see organisations like Corda, groups like Corda, and all kinds of initiatives going on. If there was two things that a company could do, just think of two, you know, two things you could ask us to do. What would it be? What would they be? Um, I suppose, and look, I, I'm. Not not hugely au fait with the, with with the with the corporate world, but I would suppose in terms of you know look at your own makeup and, and you spoke about that yourself in terms of of, of your own makeup of your uh, employees in terms of making it attractive to join your company, and in terms of trying to understand where the people who aren't currently represented in your company where they are coming from and what are the barriers because. I think many of the barriers are probably long before they get into the interview room with, with yourself and, and two or three colleagues in terms of, you know, people who have a disability. And this goes for all this is beyond, you know, it, having a more kind of racially or ethnically diverse workforce. It's having LGBTI plus people. It's having people with disabilities. So it's just I, I think the diversity uh, employment policies of corporates needs to um, 
put themselves in the position of someone seeking a role who sees barriers because of their, their particular situation. So it's not just about the uh, interview panel not asking kind of questions that might exclude certain people or something like that. It, it actually starts much earlier than that. And, and then making that known to people, making that known to groups, to NGOs, that you are open and that you will support people in their journey even towards making that initial application, sending in their their, their CV, first of all. Yeah, and, and if it helps, and it helps you in any way, I was a bit worried when the pandemic came along that a lot of the work that we had been doing in diversity, equity and inclusion might, might fall aside and lose priority. And I'd say the exact opposite has actually happened. And I see that not only at Northern Trust, but in the conversations I'm having in industry, I think we are all very focused that, and there's something that we can do here and our focus and, and organizations like uh, Open Doors help us on that journey. But, uh, so, so that that's the, the good news. So I have a kind of a final thought to you. I, I think what you're outlining is fabulous. You know, so so I, we really congratulate you on it. So, and, and we, we'll be observing it and watching it, all of us. Is there anything final you want to say as a wrap up? I want to give you the final word in terms of, you know, uh, your thoughts or your, your, your next steps or anything additional. I, I'm going to get, let you have the last word. Um, I, I, I'd say I think it's a, it's a, good, it's a good policy. Um, we've set an ambitious time frame. Uh, I know some people were criticizing saying, oh, three and a half years, that's too long. Like in order to provide the level of accommodation and it is houses and apartments, it is going to, to take three and a half years in order so this, this system can work well. I think we've all seen instances where uh, when direct provision centres were opened or being opened around the country, communities resisted that idea and for for various reasons, and I don't want to lump anybody in, uh, everyone in, but certainly there were racist overtones in, in some of these situations and usually by a small minority. And we will, in order to provide this, we will need to open six reception and integration centres around the country and we will need to provide uh, accommodation in communities all over the country and probably somewhere around 1500 units by the time this is this is all over and when we're doing that we have a job to do in terms of explaining to communities what we're doing and explaining that maybe people locally who are on the social housing list aren't being bumped off or anything like that this is a separate process but there will be times when this is controversial and I suppose we like the support we like the support of 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 communities, we'd like the support of businesses to rally behind this as a national scheme. Because if we can't, if we start seeing accommodation we've identified being burnt out or being blocked by huge protests or things like that, we can't deliver this new system. And we, the reason we're delivering this system is because Irish people want this. It's something that I've been lobbied, that all politicians have been lobbied so many times by Irish people. The majority see direct provision is wrong and it's not how we want to reflect ourselves as a country. We've got a good plan to replace it. It's not perfect and I acknowledge that, but it's a good plan and it's certainly, and I think all the NGOs recognize it's the best plan they've ever seen, but it needs buy-in, it needs support. So in two and a half years time, when things start getting a bit rocky, we need people to rally behind it and say, do you know what? Yes, we're going to have some people, uh, some, uh, some uh, international protection accommodation in our community, and that's a good thing. And let's see how we can welcome people as they move through that rather than seeing that as a threat. So I suppose that's an ask I'd have of, of yourself uh, and, and, and all the, the organizations that you work with. Okay, well, I think you can fairly take it. Certainly, you certainly have uh, my commitment, and I think you've probably got the commitment of, of the people listening. Uh, Minister Roderick O'Gorman, absolute pleasure to talk with you. We really, really wish you the very, very best in doing this great thing for Ireland, because that's all it is, and for all of these people to welcome them into this country and let's live up to our, our reputation of being a welcoming place. So thank you again, and thank you to everyone for attending today. Thanks very much. I really appreciate the opportunity.